Hello and welcome to Rapacious Reads. I'm Rebecca um, and today I thought we would discuss uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt. This book comes in three parts. Uh, I was going to say imperialism, no. Anti-Semitism, imperialism, and totalitarianism. Um, it discusses mainly uh, German totalitarianism. Uh, but it also expands on Russian totalitarianism towards um, the final chapter, and it brings up now for a millisecond. Um, so I read this book because I was reading into American fascism, and I was wondering um, if totalitarianism was inevitable. Um, and the resource, resources I was looking at earlier to describe um, American fascism um, looked a lot at Donald Trump and how he behaves as a politician and that sort of thing. Um, but what I think that I took most from Arendt's book on totalitarianism is that, um, yes, a leader is necessary, but the social conditions needed to propagate totalitarianism are more important than a single leader saying, I'm in control now, everyone listen to me, right? Um, so there are various risk factors that um, the United States of America has. Um, but um, the way um, Hannah Arendt writes, uh, those risk factors exist for nearly all uh, Western capitalist nations. Um, and part of that is just being um, post-industrial and, um, and existing um, with capitalism, which is um, like an ultimately unstable um, thing because you're always looking for new markets. And then when there are no new markets, i.e. the third world becomes not third world, <laughs> um, then what do you do, right? Um, so, I think, um, reading anti-Semitism, the first part, was so interesting to me because I haven't had much experience, um, with, like, Jewish interactions or, like, the Jewish story or anything like that. So it was fascinating to me. And I think it also showed Arendt's, um, writing in the best possible way. Uh, I was just captured by her story of Ben Disraeli. And I think that's why I'm most interested in reading her story of the socialite Rahel um, Verlagen because, um, because of the way she writes this um, sort of biography. It's, it's very interesting. Where's the quote? I'm just like stalling for time. Can you tell? I'm like, find the quote, Rebecca. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so, um, so the story is um, Ben Disraeli is um, like kind of second generation Jewish. His dad um, had sort of um, like broken away from the community and was trying to fit in with, uh, with, soci with society more. So Ben Israeli like hadn't had a bar mitzvah. He didn't interact with, um, with his community. So he was nominally Jewish, right? Here is one who started out to sell his soul to the devil, but the devil did not want the soul, and the gods gave him all the happiness on the earth. <laughs> uh, 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 he's just got such um, like an ironic life, and he's fascinating. Um, but um, yeah, so Hannah's writing style, I think, comes out best in the, in the um, anti-Semitism chapter, because we're not talking about concentration camps yet. Um, by the time you get to totalitarianism, you're just like, you know, like, you're just internally screaming the whole time. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I think the first thing um, that comes out with um, Arendt's writing is that um, this post-truth society, first of all, um, Humanity's relationship with the truth has always been difficult. Arendt uh, goes back to Plato and says, look at the philosophers trying to win arguments and using logical fa fallacies. Like, we've always 
you know, been like had a public life that was not 100% truthful. And she said that the difference between the philosophers and um, modern, i.e. like 1945 um, politics is that the philosophers were perverting truth to win an argument. Um, but uh, modern politics was using um, perverting the truth to pervert reality. They expected you to actually believe the lies they were telling you uh, or else, you know, cease existing because you couldn't belong to the party sort of thing. Right? Um, so, uh, a lot of, so Trump talks about fake news. Everyone talks about fake news. They're like, oh, you can't trust the media. Um, but this sort of uh, fake news and propagation of untruth in the media existed in, uh, I want to say the First World War, but no, it was in between um, the First and Second World Wars was this publication produced by Russians, completely false, called The Elders of Zion, which was a Jewish plan for world domination. Um, and um, the Nazis uh, used that as, as part of their political thing, saying, oh, we're protecting the people from, you know, the, the terrible Jews who, like, want to take over the world. They're infiltrating everywhere and that sort of thing. Um, but it kind of backfired on the Nazis because the people were so interested in this document because it fascinated them. Not because they were scared of the Jews taking over the world, but they were like, oh, that's how they would do it. Um, so the Nazis actually ended up implementing some of the strategies or, like, plans um, written in the Elders of Zion in their own regime. So, irony. Fascinating. Um, anyway, so the quote is, um, Not only intellectuals, but great masses of people will no, will no longer accept a presentation of past and present facts that are not in, in agreement with either of these views. So it's saying that, like, producing an ideology such as um, race or communism and seeing history through that lens sort of forces people to only accept facts that agree with one of these ideologies. And, um, and that's kind of what American people do um, with their Republican or Democrat um, morals and sensibilities. They reject facts that don't align with their party politics. So that's a dangerous way of using the truth. Okay, I love this quote. The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, i.e. the reality of experience, and the distinction between true and false, i.e. the standards of thought, no longer exist. American people? Eh? Eh? Okay, so the other risk factor that I think all of modern society has is the individualization of people and the atomization of society. So, uh, people no longer belong to a specific class. I mean, they kind of do. But there isn't that enforced sort of tribal belonging to each sect of society, right? And um, there isn't like the religious grouping that there used to be. So people have this feeling of non-belonging and that makes them vulnerable to totalitarian movements. Um, so this sort of atomization leads to loneliness and uh, totalitarianism basically promises to remove that by giving you a sense of belonging while actually further enforcing it. Um, it's so sad. So I asked myself some questions about um, Americans and imperialism. So, do Americans think all men are equal? Um, so it's written into their constitution or whatever, but I think that when you look at how they treat people, they clearly don't think that all men are equal. You look at the way they treat prisoners, you look at the way they treat women, not all men are equal, right? Um, is citizen status a birthright or a human right? It's clearly a birthright. You don't give it to just everyone. So Americans are ex exceptionalists, right? Um, do they think something sets apart the American as different from other people? Absolutely. Um, they've created this sort of American legend, uh, which is something that uh, the pan-Germans did in their movement. 
Um, they, they talked about the history of the Germanic peoples and that sort of thing. And America has told itself legends of its past about its entrepreneurial spirit, about its adventurous peoples. So they, they have this image in their heads of what an American is, right? Um, so this is a nationalized tribalism. Um, and then it allows them to deny citizenship to those who don't have these entrepreneurial, adventurous, and white qualities, right? The other thing that um, came up with imperialism was uh, a centralized government. This is something that started happening with the dual monarchy of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, there's, a, there's a funny quote here, which I think um, descri describes Congress, although I don't think they'd like me to say that. The significance of Parliament for the dual monarchy was little more than that of a not too bright deba debating society. Um, and the way the Austro-Hungarian Empire was actually ruled was by decree. Um, and to me, that sounds a lot like America being ruled by executive order. So centralizing government, right? Okay, so the third factor that puts modern society at risk for totalitarianism is um, the refugee problem. So there are multiple refugees um, coming from Syria, Eritrea, elsewhere um, in Africa and the Middle East, right? Um, so similar to America, um, in Central Europe, the right of asylum was slowly being abolished because there were too many refugees. Um, now, I would say that America doesn't have too many refugees for the amount of resources it has, um, but it's reacting in a similar way. Um, so, the reason that refugees were rejected and the right of refugee status was being abolished was because uh, of the French. Everything's the French's fault. Am I right? Um, so they instituted something called the rights of man um, post uh, French Revolution, right? Basically saying that men universally had um, this set of rights and other nations agreed with that. However, the only way to institute and enforce these rights was through a civil structure. So what ended up happening is that when you lost citizenship, you lost rights. You lost basic human rights because you weren't a citizen of any country. Um, so these people who are refugees or non-nationals were considered uh, less than human um, and they were put into internment camps. Um, and Arendt makes the argument that it was better to be a criminal um, with non-national status because that meant that the state was taking away some rights from you which implied that you had rights to be taken away. Whereas in an internment camp, you, the, the beginning premise is that nobody has any rights and the state doesn't have to help you in any way and, and anything can be taken away from you. Also, this, um, this way of thought means that you don't have the right to opinions because you're not a member of a nation, right? So it's extremely dehumanizing. Um, and then in Central Europe, so um, on top of uh, rejecting refugees, countries began to cancel earlier naturalizations due to mass entry from some countries. Sound familiar? Um, so the risk with these non-nationals within a country is that um, there becomes a growing police force. Um, more and more power is put into a police um, array instead of an army array, which is controlled by um, civil standards instead of federal standards and becomes more dangerous. And you just have people living um, with terror, uh, which is how totalitarianism is enforced. So, um, Growing police pre presence is um, is the one thing I think that would set America apart from other Western nations in terms of risk factors for totalitarianism. So I like to look at totalitarianism as a virus. It is something that wants to propagate itself 
for the pure purpose of propagating itself. It is constantly expanding and its purpose within the movement is simply to spread the movement, right? So it doesn't need to have any real reasons. Um, and its interior logic is extremely sound, right? So one of the things that first threw me off when I was looking at um, America and totalitarianism is the fact that they're, they didn't seem to be expansionist to me. Um, but with Trump talking about a space force, um, it leads me to believe that they could be expansionist um, in space. Um, so a fourth risk factor that Arendt um, talks about is that totalitarianism is ripe for rule wherever people are superfluous. And um, after the uh, after the Great War, people were superfluous and there were people without nation status in, in Central Europe and, and that was their problem. Um, but I don't think America's problem is with war and with incoming refugees. Rather, I think it's growing automation resulting in fewer and fewer jobs. And we, we know that they're, um, we're losing more and more um, entry level, um, labor level jobs, which is what immigrants from Mexico and South America do when they come into a country. So there may be a resentment from earlier naturalized people or um, white people um, that nobody is going to have a job when um, Mex Mexicans and South Americans come into the country. And um, that's a scary economic situation, for sure. Totalitarianism relies on political instability and lack of hierarchy within government. And so you can see Trump constantly firing people from within his cabinet um, or within the top layers of, of his government. He didn't fill many of the roles when he first came into power, which creates um, instability within the government because nobody is quite sure what they're supposed to be doing. And information isn't passed on when a role is filled, right? Um, so this means that you have to rely on, on what Trump says or interpreting what Trump says in order to keep your job. Um, and that is how the leader functions in totalitarianism. The leader has a very special role in that he takes the blame for everything done in his name um, and it, it allows other people who commit heinous acts to absolve themselves. Um, the leader is the only one truly responsible for everything in the country, which is another area that I think Trump doesn't embody the leader principle because he doesn't take responsibility for white nationalist actions or something like that. Right. And I think I just want to leave you with a, a quote from the preface um, that Hannah Arendt wrote much later than this book was published. It was published in 1950, only five years after the end of the war. And then um, she added some sections into the totalitarian section um, following the fall of um, Bolshevism in Russia. Um, so this was written um, after that. The hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. We can no longer afford to take that which was good in the past and simply call it our heritage, to discard the bad and simply think of it as a dead load which by itself time will bury in oblivion. And this is why all efforts to escape from the grimness of the present into a nostalgia for a still intact past or the anticipated oblivion for, of a better future are vain.